Hello everyone, I am Tacit, and today I'm going to be going over the Gems of War Hound of Fate event. So let's get into that. We got ourselves a Q-Sif that we can go and craft for 300 glory this week. It is a ultra rare that comes with the brown green arcane trait stone. You could use this either for uh, earlier on in the game, you'd want to use it for a soothsayer or diviner. And later on in the game, you'd want to use it on something like a Sylvania Moor to constantly do entangles. Other than that, as far as this troop, it is made for excessively early, early game, like under level 100, maybe under level 200. But basically, unless you're a very low level player, you will not be bothering to touch this troop. Uh, it deals a small amount of damage to an enemy, boosted by all allied Fey and Beast, which of course is itself as well. And there's quite a few of them within the uh, Kingdom of Bright Forest as well. And other than that, it gains five souls every single cast. So basically, it's going to get a kind of average uh, little hit. I believe uh, hits about a 50 or so with all the boost ratios that you can get. Uh, of course, if you get something like, let's say, five of them onto your team, a combination of five Fey Beasts, and of course this counts as two bonuses since it's uh, both of them, you would end up getting 20 additional damage onto its ability. So somewhere around the 40 to 50 range is around what's going to be hitting every single cast, which for 12 mana is not the greatest, especially with no board control. But at least earlier on in the game, you don't tend to have stronger options than that, so it is good down there. Other than that, it also has uh, slightly noteworthy. Uh, it's actually pretty decent to trait itself, actually. It has 20% dodge and also has immune to mana drain and all the other stuff that mana shield would have. So it's pretty good in that regard. Anyways, onto the actual event stuff. So, we have ourselves a uh, bonus to all uh, Bright Forest as well as to all Fey. This is nearly the entirety of Bright Forest. I believe only one troop in the entire kingdom does not count as both. So basically the entire kingdom is 20% bonus this week, which is kind of cool. Other than that, you also have 10% on all Fey, which comes in handy on a few uh, instances throughout the game. Uh, you also end up getting 40 souls every single time you use the Q-Sif in either PvP or Explore. This is somewhat noteworthy as this Friday is going to be the Treasure Gnome event, which you'll be, have a higher rate of getting Treasure Gnomes as well as uh, a chance of getting uh, Vault Keys off of them, or a higher rate of getting Vault Keys off of them. And you'll be able to get 40 souls every single battle while doing that if you so choose. So if you've been needing to go farm souls, that'd be a pretty good time to uh, do so. Probably more so in Explore than specifically in PvP, though you could do it in both. And other than that, you will need to kill a bunch of things in PvP. Pretty standard one, pretty easy one to do. Just keep doing PvP over and over again. Generally, casual uh, one trophy repick pick with constant repicking or just doing anything in normal PvP is generally the way to go to get all of that up and just do any standard battle. Every kill just counts simply as a single one. And all you have to do is just do that 750 times and you get a decent amount of gems among a, some gem keys as well. So, some other things that are noteworthy this week. Uh, the Soul Forge. There is something we've been waiting for for quite some time now. There is finally the Ubastet in the Soul Forge. He's around the second or third best mythic in the game, depends on how you really look at it. But he is definitely among one of the absolute better ones. He deals a uh, amount of damage to the two weakest enemies that's boosted by all enemies attack, which makes it a pretty substantial amount of damage. Uh, or not all enemies attack, my bad. Everything's attack, including uh, allies and enemies. So even stronger than what I just mentioned. But yeah, it does really decent damage, and if it gets a kill on one, it gets to kill both of them, which is super potent, and is just really, really good at securing kills. You, because every single time you get one, you're getting two. So basically, you get him down two successful times, and you just won the battle. And it's only 22 mana cost. It's ran very similarly to how a Catcher's the Bull runs, except Ubistet, even if he gets his stats reduced, still is just as effective. Whereas with a Catcher's, it loses its effectiveness as its stats go lower. Other than that, it has a Fiery Storm, so every single time it does secure one of those kills, you're going to be getting a Red Storm. And other than that, if it uh, damage wasn't already good enough with its uh, attack boost ratio thing, it also ends up getting one additional magic per turn, as well as one additional attack per turn, both of which basically help to increase the uh, damage of his ability. Other than that, there is one other thing that's semi-noteworthy uh, to craft, and that is a World Breaker. He is the best thing that really helps put together a Dragon Team if you're running endgame Dragon Teams. He is tied at the highest mana cost in the entire game at 32, but he does generate a lot of mana. He has a static 18 explosion, so even if you're a newer player or mid-range player, he's always going to be doing 18 explosions, which at that level range is quite a lot. And even in late game, it's still a lot. It's enough to clear out most of the board most of the time. And it deals damage to all enemies, so it's gaining a huge amount of mana back, as well as just damage. And generally, once you get it going, it's just going to stay going, especially if you have uh, another exploder on your team. And that's basically as far as Soul Forge is uh, concerned this week. But yeah, if any of you have been waiting out for Ubisted, it is available. I think I'm not going to bother crafting a second one, 
but uh, definitely worth having one of them if you haven't already gotten one. Uh, do keep in mind it is better to get Infernus first, and it is possibly better to get Ferris Raw first, depending on how you look at it. But definitely 100% get Infernus before you get an Ubistet. So do keep that in mind if you have a limited amount of uh, diamonds still. Let's go grab our tribute real quick. Don't want to leave that laying around. And apparently we have a pet as well. We'll go do that later. But anyways, let's go and go over event key. So are event keys worth using this week? Uh, somewhat. Somewhat. It is mainly going to be used for two purposes. Technically three, depending on how you look at it. But if we go over to Bright Forest and then you click Show All, uh, it'll bring up every single troop that's available for his kingdom. And Ultra Rares and Hires are the ones that are uh, you'll be able to get from the drop table. The three most noteworthy ones that you'd be looking out for is the Two Legends and the Mythic. Um, all three of these are some of the best fairy fire options in the game, or pretty much some of the only fairy fire options in the game. But all three of them are among the best, particularly the Glitter Claw and the Queen Titania. Uh, Glitter Claw fairy fires all enemies when it casts, as well as having a potential extra turn with its convert, which also generates its mana back, which is really cool. Uh, other than that, Queen Titania is basically the Queen Mab of fairy fire instead of freeze. So it gets a fairy fire every single time it gets an uh, extra turn and very, very easy to uh, zero turn, just fairy fire the entire enemy team out. And other than that, she has pretty decent damage. And not only that, but if there's enough reds on the board, which generally you would use a red mana generating team with her, like with a Yagwe or Hellcat or literally anything that feeds her red, uh, and you'll be able to get an ex extra turns off of those as well. So you don't even waste any turns, not only on our fairy fire, but also you don't even waste any turns on our ability. So you can get a lot of damage down that way. Also fairy fire, uh, what it does, they even say it, uh, for any of you that don't know, Fairy Fire makes it so you do 50% more damage or spell damage to the enemy. So if it's inflicted with Fairy Fire and you were going to do 20 spell damage to them off of your cast, it would then do 30 instead. So basically it just increases it by 50%. And other than that, Tsuna, if you didn't end up picking her up uh, a few weeks ago when she was available, um, she is available right now in Event Keys if you want her. She's not really that good, though she does have Fairy Fire whenever you take uh, reds. And she also is one of the better true damage options in the game, though generally she takes too many casts to really bother with her. Uh, one nice thing about her is she does gain so much HP that she becomes pretty tanky and unkillable, especially with 20% stats this week. But for the most part, she's pretty mid-range as far as a mythic is concerned, and not really one you should be worrying about. You should be worrying about getting Glitter Claw and Queen Titania. And if you happen to pick up Asuna by doing so, then that's good, but she's not really needed to go pick up, so do keep that in mind. So, invasions this week. We have that, of course. That is not where that is located, though. Guild and over to invasions. So, invasions. We are stuck having to use uh, Faye this week, though that is not too bad because we got an insanely good uh, trip to use this week. Um, it is this guy over here. We got this new weapon. Well, first, let's go over to trip. This is the best invasion trip they've ever added. Uh, Rage was insanely easy last week due to Vanessa, and invasion is going to be super easy this week because of Old Man Oak Root. Uh, it's so good that it could possibly even be used outside of invasions. It destroys an enemy's armor, so it's already insanely good, and then it deals its standard amount of damage, but technically that's way, way more damage than what it normally does, because this is invasion, so you're tearing out its armor, and then boom, you're basically just one-shotting it with its ability. Even at three times, I think you would pretty much always be able to one-shot, uh, and of course at four times, five times, that'd make it even easier. And other than that, it has a Leaf Storm whenever an enemy dies, which is decent, especially since he uses that color. 33% score reduction, which of course you're generally using this guy in first slot, uh, particularly in invasions. And of course the standard invasion thing, which makes him do more damage to towers, and one of the whole reasons you even put him in first slot. Because of invasions, you eventually reach the point where you're up against four towers, and of course he'd end up doing all extra damage to all of them. Other than that, we got this new weapon. The perks on it aren't necessarily the greatest. Let me actually go show the perks on it for any of you that haven't actually gotten it yet. Do pretty much get every single weapon that ever comes out. Oh no, I just forgot what it's called though. Problem. Uh, I forget what color it even is. I believe that's the right color. Uh, fail. No, that isn't. <laughs> Wait, hold up. My bad. Let me go double check that one last time. Invasions. It is called a... Where to go? Where to go? It is called... A, oh, it's green purple. Oh, yeah, it was basically the other um, crescendo, if you don't have a crescendo. But, yeah, it's called the Trickster Shot. Let's just go throw in Shot, and that will bring it up. Just want to show its perks real quick for any of you that don't currently have it. And this is the weapon. So, is it worth trading? No, it is not, unfortunately. Uh, I would sooner hold them and use it for crescendo than I would on this weapon. But it, it gains a decent amount of attack, HP, and then one magic. As far as its stats, it definitely has a nice mix of stats as far as what it gives. Uh, Hunter's Mark's first enemy, which is good. Uh, reduces a random skill on first enemy by two, which is not horrible, but not the greatest. Uh, also gains two to random skill, similarly. Not the ho most horrible skill, but also not the greatest. 
And it also enchants itself, which is the best thing that it actually has. Unfortunately, it has nothing that clears the board or anything at all, and I don't think an enchant on its own would really be enough to justify fully maxing out this weapon. So for the most part, it's not really a weapon I would deal with much. It destroys an enemy's armor uh, with the standard little bit of damage into it, and then gains uh, two magic, uh, boosted by the amount of armor tiered at a 3 to 1 boost ratio. Given how many mangle-like weapons there are in the game, I wouldn't really say go on on this one. They're probably going to add a better one into the future that would have better perks that would actually be worth it than bothering to upgrade this one. Of course, still get the weapon um, because you'll be needing it for kingdom upgrades and the such, but I would not really bother uh, specifically upgrading it. Anyways, let's go and actually show the team for Invasion. I keep clicking on games, such a habit, but we'll go and uh, just fight and go into a for, uh, for uh, Tower 1. So right here, uh, what I'm running with is Double Old Man uh, Oak Root. And if you don't have double of him, you can replace out one of them, the further one with a dryad, and put it like all the way in back. A uh, dryad will be able to give you greens onto the board. It will also barrier and heal your first slot so that your one that you do have will never die. It's um, basically just going to help keep your team going. And other than that, we're just using a mountain crusher, one of the, I believe, first time ever. I'm not actually bothering to run a mangle like weapon in Arena or Dawnbringer or something. But uh, yeah, the reason we're going with Mountain Crusher is he already has the armor tier, so we don't really need to have our weapon have armor tier because he does it for us. So uh, we would just want to prioritize getting more mana on it. Also, in this instance, I'm currently actually still using Bard because I figured given that it's two of him, we might as well give him a little bit extra stats to help him hit even harder on both his skulls as well as his uh, spell. But um, yeah, if we go under our perks real quick, go under class, go under this, uh, I end up giving it instead of its plus one purple, it's enchant. Um, this will be pretty useful since we will be taking a lot of greens and getting him up So that'll just get us enchanted and get our weapon automatically and also a really cheap option wisp this week uh, Dispels all enemies. This is really good because um, Invasions in particular have a lot of enchant as well as barriers So you kind of want to have a way to get through all of that and yeah, that's essentially the team and uh, All the options are really cheap this time around a dryad is a rare if you need to go replace out the second one of these uh, This guy you can get with a couple hundred gems uh, Wisp um, is an ultra rare, and yeah, that's all you need. That's all you need to go through. Oh, and I guess Mountain Crusher obviously is your weapon, which you need to be around level 200. If you don't have Mountain Crusher, you can use basically any uh, mana generating weapon, or not even use your hero if you don't even want to. Of course, uh, you'd kind of want to just because it does gain a little bit of extra XP, but really anything that can kind of control a board under hero would be perfectly fine as well. But we'll throw a Wisp here. Try getting some adjacent damage. Get our mana up. Basically, every shot we ever do will one shot. And you can see we now have our two one shots. Let me just clear out the board. Uh, I'm accidentally taking kills, apparently. And as you can see, it is ridiculously easy to do invasions this week. Um, that's pretty much how the entirety of invasions goes. It is uh, by far last week easiest raids and this week easiest invasions. So if you wanted to, <laughs> try doing it. It's definitely uh, the easiest accessibility that you would ever have to leaderboard. Though, with that being said, it's probably going to be the hardest to ever make leaderboard because so many people will be trying for it. But as far as, like, actually winning out these battles, it is just super ridiculously easy this week. Anyways, I believe that is everything. So let's get into some teams. Both of them are very early game teams that I wanted to show just to kind of show uh, accessible things to actually use with them. So first off, we're going to go into whatever this easier battle is, mainly because I'm going to be running a cheap Kusif team. Uh, this is that ultra rare that I was talking about. This is something you would use at basically only uh, level 200 and below, maybe even only level 100 and below. It's something that you'd use super, super early game, mainly if you were like a new player who just started within the last few weeks or so, or the last month, this would be something you'd want to get. You'd easily, even if you just started like today, you'd be able to have this team by the end of the week pretty much, other than maybe not have this tome fully maxed, but you'd at least be able to put some upgrades into it. But basically the team is Tomo Wizard Lear. Tome of Wizardry, uh, low-key one of the best weapons in the game. It explodes a gem, which doesn't seem like much, but it also has another effect onto it, two of them actually. It, if you have it fully maxed, that's not where you go to see that. If you have it fully maxed, uh, which uh, ends up giving you these two perks, uh, it also gives you a little bit of uh, life and attack. For whatever reason, they give it three magic, which is pitiful because it doesn't use magic. But uh, the main thing here is it gains barrier and it drains three mana from the first enemy. Barrier basically meaning so you will be able to mitigate a whole instance of damage, which is really good. 
and three uh, mana drain to make sure that you keep draining out the first enemy's troop, which is generally the one that's going to be getting the mana the most. So really nice combination to have because it gives you a lot of protection. It makes sure the enemy isn't casting as much, and it makes sure you are protected when they finally take skulls or if they finally do get enough mana to cast against you. So this team is utilizing the, I don't even want to try pronouncing that word, uh, Z Zinia, Zinio, Zinu, Yu, Yi, the bird. The phoenix looking bird <laughs> is a fey beast, which ends up creating green um, and ends up creating seven. It's basically like a rock worm, except different in a way. Um, but yes, it's basically just going to keep boosting with this. All three of them are Fey Beast, which gives you a six times boost ratio. That means you're getting a total of 24. Yes, 24. Math. How does it work? Um, yes, 24 <laughs> additional damage, which uh, currently with my stats would give about 51 damage or exactly 51. Of course, earlier on in the game, that'd be more like a 40 or so as far as how much damage, but still way above average of what you'd be hitting earlier on in the game. But basically, that's the whole premise of the team, set it to standard double green. And I do want to switch my banner real quick on our hero. If you do happen to have a class that can do it, uh, you would want to actually set your class to a plus one purple. Not really mandatory, though it is somewhat helpful in this particular instance, as um, it will help you to one turn your book, uh, or at least two turn it if you don't end up surging. Anyways, we'll go with this. Uh, basically, whole premise is get the phoenix-looking bird thing to full mana as quickly as possible, ideally off of a green surge, and then we just kind of go from there. So right off the bat, we'll take the blues. Uh, it also starts with half mana, which makes it even easier to get them rolling. Uh, doesn't look like we have much of a board to work with here, so we're going to go and... Oh, come on, everything gives them something. So I guess we'll go and... Sure, we'll give them something. I want the mana. So he'll go take an extra turn right there, almost get full mana on the other thing. We'll take our reds, which don't really do anything. I really need to start getting our greens as soon as we possibly can. Uh, and we already got both of them up. Very nice. And now we kind of just start spamming. We could go throw this down a little preemptively, even though we kind of don't need it at the moment, just to kind of get ourselves a barrier so that they can't really hit us. But uh, I think we're just going to go into it and use it for board control instead in case we find something that we can actually lower here. Like, for example, we could take that right there to get a little bit more green. They both have already have mana, so I'm just going to go for it, though. And double check if we have alignment. Doesn't look like we have anything too good, so we'll just keep throwing it down. We'll keep hitting random enemies. If we need to go pick off a kill at any point, we can go try hitting for the very high focus hit. I'm actually going to leave that exactly as is and not take it in hopes that we can land the extra turn, and we do indeed land it. Now that there's not as many greens on the board, I think we are going to go secure a kill real quick. I'm going to go for this and hopefully randomly hit the uh, green. Actually, probably would have made slightly more sense to actually go for the green immediately, just to make sure we could have gotten that kill. But um, we could go for barrier here. It's going to hit the two weakest. Uh, that's not enough damage because it's not true damage, so I'm actually going to leave it as is. I just go for the poke, trying to get this thing poked. Uh, these things can loop pretty easily, so we're just going to kind of keep going with them and hoping that will be enough. We'll get the excess mana into him after some amount of time, and then we can go for one more clean kill and just kind of go from there. So right here is about to go and take the skull. Given that we might not be able to overlap it, we could either take the skull itself or go and explode it. I think I'm actually going to go explode it just to give our hero a little bit more protection. Especially if you're earlier on in the game, you'd probably be wanting to do that a little bit more excessively. Just to make sure you're constantly barriered from those heavier hits. And at this point, every single cast we do will indeed get a kill secured. And we'll just go wipe it out with this, even though it doesn't really matter too much which way we go with it. But that's pretty much that. And of course, he's gaining that 5 soul every single cast that you do end up using him. It's not that many, but it'll add up over time if you are using him in various teams. Not really something I would advise too much. It really, if you are going to be using him, the main thing you should be using in is just some kind of standard explorer team, like a Sunbird uh, using the Q-Sif, a Firebomb, and Hero using literally any weapon. Of course, I'm just using Dawnbringer, but really anything is perfectly fine. And uh, of course, the whole premise is get Firebomb down immediately, then get Sunbird down as immediately as possible after that, and uh, then either just throw the Sunbird down again or clear out with whatever else you need on your team. But uh, let's get it up, go throw another poke at it, and that'll pretty much just be the match. And uh, most explore battles, you'd be able to kill out like that. You can also take out easier PvP battles the same way as you just saw right there. But generally, um, you would want to do it on Explorer as it's just a lot more consistent. But you can also do it on things like 4 times Firebomb 2, and it's uh, easily going to kill it through. And stuff like that. And other than that, let's go and show... I guess we'll go up against the Dragons. Let's go show a... Uh, actually, let's see. What is this team? Nah. Now we'll give it a shot. <laughs> let's go lose against the meta again, just for fun. Uh, but let's go do a very budget Ubistet. As I mentioned, Ubistet is available in the Soul Forge this week. And here is basically the cheapest viable Ubistet team you can ever make. 
Uh, of course, the best Ubistet team you could ever make is pretty much what he's using right there. Uh, the uh, Divine Protector, and if you don't have Divine Protector, you can use Mercy, with Infernus, Ubistet, and Divine Ishbala. Very, very excessively commonly used right now, uh, as it's one of the among one of the strongest teams in the game. Uh, other than that, if you want to go build the cheap version, actually, this is pretty cool. Cheapest version versus most expensive version. Uh, but cheapest version, uh, Mountain Crusher, which you get around level 200 or so from having, I believe, 35 brown hero mastery. Uh, Goblin. Oh, also, I should probably go mention that real quick. I probably should mention that a little bit earlier. But uh, Purple Tome, I believe you get at about 10 purple mastery if you're wondering, like, why you don't currently own it. If you get your purple mastery up on your hero uh, from the level ups that you get. Um, you should be able to get it within easily a few days just by putting it all in on purple until you get this. It doesn't take that long. I believe it's around 10. I forget the exact value, but you get it pretty early on in the game. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, Mountain Crusher, you get it at around 35 brown mastery. Explodes all the browns on the board, or it doesn't actually explode all the browns, but it does enough explosions that essentially every single time you're exploding all the browns. A uh, Goblin is mainly here so we can target with Ubistet. It gets a free turn uh, poke onto an enemy. And this is good because we can lower them into kill range of Ubistet while also targeting down which specific one we want to kill. So it's actually really potent. It's one of the few teams that you would, or one of the few instances where Goblin is actually best in slot for something, which is kind of odd, but yeah, given that it's like one of the first trips you ever get. Uh, Zuru you get for free from completing out the Merlantis Kingdom. And once you complete that out, you get this. It's really good in that it dispels all enemies. It's actually the best dispeller in the game. It's also the best stat reducer in the game, capable of constantly stat reducing. It doesn't actually have the highest amount, but it keeps exploding all the blues, which makes it really good at constantly mana generating for your team. And that combined with Mountain Crushers is going to constantly keep your team with mana. And other than that, of course, we have Ubistet, which you can craft for 4,000 diamonds this week. And basically, this is the cheapest thing you could ever build with it. Uh, if you want to make it even cheaper, you're going to replace out um, your hero with a different tank, or another goblin. The only problem with that is you will not be gaining hero XP if you do that. Also, as far as banner, your banner should be a plus one brown, plus one purple. Um, or if you're using a hero class that can do plus one purple, uh, you should be using a plus one brown, plus one blue, which is what we're doing here. Basically, you want to make sure you have a plus one into your mountain crusher always. And you always want to or, uh, make sure you have a plus one into Azura's purple if you can, as well as both the purple and the blue if, if possible. And in this case, using a bard, we are capable of doing that. Anyways, let's get into this. Essentially, what we're going to want to do is either get the Azura or the Mountain Crusher as up uh, immediately as possible. Generally, this is going to be the Mountain Crusher, as if you're using a hero class that starts with half mana, it'll be quicker to get the Mountain Crusher. As far as what we're going to want to target, given that he's using that team, we're going to want to get rid of his Ubistet as quickly as possible. So we'll go do that, take a brown, throw down our explosions, go from there. I gave him a little bit too much mana right there. It comes to backfire quite a bit, but we'll see. Uh, we'll go try getting an Azura down. Hopefully that will actually land. Uh, not too many blues, they're not really in good locations, but I believe we have lowered him enough that we can actually get this going. So just in case this isn't enough, I'm not going to bother calculating out. So what we're going to do is throw another goblin at this. If we did calculate it out, one thing we could actually do is use this goblin right now on uh, Infernus in hopes that we'd go and double kill this. So I'm not fully certain if that's enough damage. We could risk it right now and actually do that. And I think we are just for fun. So we're going to do that. And now we're going to just hope that that is enough damage. I obviously didn't bother calculating it. You can also get attack reductions on accident with a zero, which you just kind of have to deal with. We got one there, but generally it's going to do one in four each time. And it's not going to matter too much most of the time. So we're throwing Ubistet here. It was indeed enough damage. So as you saw there, we were able to use the goblins to secure those two dead. And yeah, you basically just do the exact same thing again. Throw your two exploders. Um, use your goblin to lower one of them into kill range. And then just clear it out with Ubistet. And it's the cheapest possible team you can use um, that utilizes a Ubistet. Which uh, basically, as soon as you get Ubistet, you would easily have every other component. Except for maybe Mountain Crusher. Uh, so really easy to end up building. So we'll just go for that again. Another stat reduction. Um, we do not appear to have enough damage for sure this time. So I'm going to go and get Goblin up. Um, the lower one appears to be the hero. So we're just going to poke him real quick. I don't know if that's fully in range yet. We'll just go and see. Should be. And yeah, down it goes. And yeah, that's basically what the cheapest version looks like against the most expensive. It does actually win against it. Um, I don't know if that's actually the quickest team you could ever use around a lower level range as far as like the exact team we're using right now. Still pretty potent though. Kind of a weird kind of team. But it definitely gets the job done and it's uh, relatively accessible aside from Ubistet. But anyways guys, that's everything that I wanted to cover in this video. If you guys still have any other questions, feel free to leave it in the comment section below. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching, and have a wonderful week. Oh, wait, actually, three things I just still want to mention. My bad. I always forget to think of something at the end, don't I? <laughs>
<laughs> but some things I do just want to mention very, very quick. I think the pet is what actually threw me off from mentioning these. On Wednesday, we are getting the yellow Guild War pet, the little griffin that ends up giving you yellow bonus or a little extra armor bonus when you use four of them in a team. Uh, on Thursday, we are getting the Archer class event, which is a pretty mid-range kind of hero class these days. It's uh, really well-rounded, but it doesn't really excel at any one thing in particular other than kind of summoning spam. It does have a lot of things that can summon, which are really annoying. But other than that, that's about the only thing it really has going to it. Then it's just well-rounded. It starts with half mana, has 15% extra or 50% chance to instant kill on skulls. It's definitely an interesting class. Uh, other than that, this Friday, we're getting two things, a new mythic, as well as the Treasure Gnome event. And with the Treasure Gnome event, that increases your chance of finding Treasure Gnomes, as well as uh, Vault Keys from those Treasure Gnomes. It's also a good time to specifically throw your Vault Keys if you've been saving any. Not really needed to save them for Vault Events, but there is a slightly higher chance that you'll find Vault Keys inside your Vault Keys if you do them during a Vault Event. So I've actually never personally found a Vault Key in a Vault Key, but it, it does increase the chance and it is indeed possible still. So do keep that in mind. But anyways, guys, if you still have anything else you want me to go over, let me know. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Best of luck if you're going to be opening up event keys or anything. Best of luck with the uh, drop table on Friday. If you're going for the new Mythic, you'd want to be opening Glory and Gem keys for that. If you're going to be trying for the new Mythic this Friday. And uh, that's basically it. Leave any questions you have, and I'll see you all later. Goodbye, everyone.